Um, so obviously we started from chapter two. Are you able to see my screen in terms of it? Yes, exactly. Yes, so I did that. I went ahead, downloaded the zip, et cetera. I created this particular folder and under that I unzipped that. So I have a data folder under this and that's that, okay. So then after that, I went here and mine is a Windows based system. Uh, I downloaded the, the Docker image. So I came here and, um, you know, so if you click on this, it takes you here, here and I think it pulls up immediately. Uh, one second. Wow. So I went here to the Windows option. I came here and then I downloaded the image from here. So this was the image I had and, and then I installed it. Okay. So the once I installed it, um, it goes through that entire process. He says that you can start by doing all this Docker pull, et cetera, and whatever. So the one thing that is not implicit here is that you need to start the Docker demon. Because I thought that once it installs it, the path should be available. So when you say Docker, it should actually be able to locate that. I didn't realize you need to have the Docker uh, demon running. So you actually go in and you start your Docker instance, correct? Like for any of the things to happen subsequently, the daemon has to be running. Mm -hmm. So maybe what I'll do is let me close this out. Okay, let me close this out and let's close this and let's pretend that we uh, like, actually, I don't know if I should do that, but um, so for here, I'm on the dollar sign here. And if, if I say, uh, you know, Docker, it'll say command not found. Why? Because you actually don't have the daemon running. Okay. So you, did you say something? No, no, I'm following. Yeah. So you first need to launch the daemon that you installed. And so at this point, when you do that, it actually starts up a container. So I don't know what these are. So I'm guessing this is like the actual uh, whatever, right? Like I, because I went ahead and I've already done this step where they ask you to use Docker, run, whatever. So you, you're you essentially mapping your current working directory to this data folder on the container. So then that way you have all of that in that um, particular data folder. Mm -hmm. So I have already done that. And what I have now is this instance, which is running. So I came here and I just clicked on this, okay. And so I guess that I'm already, so if I do present working directory here, I get this and there's nothing under this. But uh -huh. I. Sorry, go ahead. When you click that run, it opens a terminal for you automatically. Uh, yeah, so uh -huh. so for example, this one, right? Mm -hmm. So what I did first, Shamsuddin, is I actually ran this in PowerShell. Okay. Um, so I ran this in PowerShell. I've already gone through all of that earlier. Okay, so um, I, I switched into the directory on my local folder where I have mm -hmm. created this data as CAT, whatever under data, I first moved into that directory because here they say explicitly that when uh, first get uh, navigate to this new directory that you have created on your local drive and then run this image, uh, run this command. So I ran this command doc, docker run, da, 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 whatever, et cetera. And so when I did that, I found that I had uh, all of this, this structure here. So now let's go out of this and let me pull up, uh, let me pull up a docker, okay. Let's just start from the beginning, okay, Shamsuddin, let's assume that I'm also gonna close the daemon, okay? I'm gonna close the daemon, I'm closing everything. So um, let's start up PowerShell here and it's just gonna pull up like whatever, this is my, this is my user directory. So I'm gonna first go ahead to the directory under which I have created, like I, I created this folder here. So I'm going to say cd d cl 2 e um, data, okay? And under that, I have the data folder, which I unzip, and it's got all these chapters. So this is the first thing that you do when you actually download the data directory. So now once I've done this, I've already installed a Docker. They say that first go to the new directory, which you want to map to the container instance. And after you do that, you copy this, and you stick it in here, okay? So that's what I'm gonna do. I've installed Docker, I've unzipped the data uh, zipped file, and now I'm gonna run this. So what it does is it first tries to look for a local instance of your, um, um, it's already run the Docker thing, I guess. 
uh, yeah, I guess because I've already run it before, I, it's not having to like, you know, get everything from the instance. So it's already in the dollar thing, but I don't know if, and plus it has launched this. You see this little Docker's icon here. So let's say I quit that. Okay, let's say I quit the Docker desktop and then I come back here to this and I, and I just type in the command Docker. It'll first, so it is able to locate it in the path. So it's able to find Docker in the path. So it doesn't give you any weird message and it's given you like all the commands that you can use. So now I say that use the current working directory and map it to the doc with the container like location. And when you run that, it's um, you didn't connect, it may indicate it's not running. So now we're saying that the Docker daemon is not running. So when you do it that way, um, so I'm a little bit confused. Does it mean that you have to first start the Docker because he does not say that here anywhere that you need to run the Docker um, daemon before you do that. I thought it would actually start it when you, when you give it that command, that is this Docker run, whatever, um, right? Or are you supposed to start the Docker? Maybe you're supposed to start it like this first. Maybe you first start, maybe this is the command to start the daemon and the other one is only for mapping, I think. So let me try that, okay? This is probably start the Docker. See, now we're saying that the Docker daemon is not running. So what does that mean? That you have to like have the daemon running? Are you there, Shamsuddin? Yes. Oh. Yeah, let me, can you see it better now? Um, can you increase it a bit? What's that? How do I increase the size? Yeah, can you increase it a bit? Okay, how do I increase the size? Uh, maybe this, oh, this way? Yeah, yeah, that'll work. Okay. Can you see it better now? Okay. Okay, okay, so now when I type in Docker here, right, it will give you the command. So it's able to find it in the path. Okay, so you know that it's able to locate the dot Docker path. So that's not the issue. But when I type, when I just say run Docker, it says that this error indicates that the Docker daemon is not currently running. So what does that mean? That you first start the Docker daemon before you can do anything or what is it? How do you start the daemon? Run, help, publish, read only, runtime string, stop, TTY. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and start the Docker instance. It doesn't say anywhere though in his uh, book that you start the daemon. So my understanding was that when you run the Docker command, that will actually run the daemon, but it appears that that is not the case. So let me start it. Okay, so now you can see that this, it, it says here that the Docker desktop is starting up and then it, it launches here. Uh, you'll see it coming up here. Docker desktop is starting. Did you get this far, Shamsuddin, when you did yours? Are you there? Okay, so now Docker is running. So let me go back to PowerShell and let me run that command again, the other one. And now you don't get that message, right? So it actually comes up. Um, 
Okay, so you see now it is here. And if I do a present working directory here, something weird is okay. Present working directory, it gives you this. So I'm going to reduce the size because it keeps. Okay, so now it's here. So apparently the daemon has to be run. Mm. Does that make sense? Sorry, I, I didn't know if you were there. I had to stop sharing because I couldn't hear you and I thought maybe I'd lost you. So, okay. So the beam needs to be launched and then you come here and then you can see that you have, uh, you know, stuff here. And now you can just do like three commands and you can change it to CD data, say chapter two, which is what we're doing. Um, oh, interesting. I wonder why. Present working directory. So I could change just a minute back. So, so here's what goes on sometimes. Sometimes I can't see the data folder at all, okay? Sometimes. Mm. Um, and I don't understand why. I'm gonna close this again and launch another uh, instance of uh, the PowerShell. Okay, I'm gonna open up PowerShell. I'm having a few issues with understanding some conceptual things here. And I don't know it's because I don't get the concept of this. So um, let's do this. Um, let's run that Docker. I'm, I'm going to first move into my directory where I created. Uh, I'm going to say CD DSAT CL2E data and CD data under that. And then I'm gonna run the Docker uh, command. Um, so when you do that, um, let's see what the present working directory is, it's that. So if I try now to change to CD, um, what is it, CD, what is it, uh, Shamsuddin C? Uh, I think he says it's, what is it called? Um, yeah, so CD data something something. Uh, yeah, CD data CHO2, CD data CHO2, okay? Now it says that that data doesn't, that folder doesn't exist. Whereas if you, if you look at what's under here, you see, I don't know what these are. I can't see the data folder anymore. So I'm going to try this. I'm going to map it. I'm going to do this. I can't. Let's exit this. Um, and let's paste that where he actually maps it to the current working directory. So when you map that to your current working directory, and then you try and do this, you say data CHO2, it works. You see that? So you have to, you can't run it just say, you can't just run it as a Docker instance because then it's getting messed up with your present working directory and where that container instance has been mapped. So you have to, actually CD into the folder that you you created for this purpose, and then you map that to this. And when you do that, then you're able to change it to this data CH. So now if I go here and look at it, I can see now that I have the Python script and I have this. Does that make sense to you? If you wanna try this at your end and see if you know you can get it to work, then I think that'll, that'll be good because then everyone will be on the same page. Alternatively, let me also show you one more thing. So uh, I don't know which one of these I started. I'm going to kill one of these instances. Um, let's remove this. And let's take the second one. If I open this up here and I say present working directory on here, let me also increase the size of this so that you can see it. And I say present working directory on here. It's here. And now I should be able to do the same thing. Data. CHO2. Does that make sense, Shamsuddin? Uh, I can't I can't hear you at all. Oh, Brett is here. 
Hey, Shamsuddin, I can't hear you. Are you saying anything? Can't hear you. Hey, Brett. Hey, I'm, we are so glad you joined. Shamsuddin, is your volume back? Yeah, um, I can hear you always. <laughs> yeah, we couldn't hear you. Could you hear him or is it me? Yeah, I can hear you very well. Brett, very could good. you hear him? Like yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it was I think he was uh, off before, but we can hear him. I can hear him now. Uh, yeah, now okay. we can, yeah. Maybe my mic was bad. Uh, we have a question for you, Brett, and we're a little bit confused. Okay. So the first thing that that this book doesn't say is that you need to have the, the demon running before you can run any of these commands, right? So they say that you can uh, install it, correct? You can you can install it, and once it's installed, you'll invoke the following command. But however, none of these commands work for me unless I already pre-launched the instance. So in other words, I needed to have this guy running here with the icon before I could get any of these commands to work. Is this true or am I doing something wrong? Um, trying, to, trying to understand the question. Yeah. So okay, like let me do this. I'm gonna close out and I'm gonna close the demon. I'm, 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 I'm gonna pretend like I've just now like, you know, um, pulled that instance. And I'm going to actually come here and close this. I'm going to say quit Docker desktop. Okay, I just did that. Okay. I uh, close this one out, and I'm just going to pull up PowerShell. Okay. So okay, let me uh, pull up. Can you share your screen? Oh, you can't see my screen. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Yeah, we were we were really praying that you would join us. Um, okay. So this is this is my. Uh, um, PowerShell. So what happens is that if I just come in here and I say Docker, it, it pops up all these help things. So it's clearly finding it in the path, okay? Mm -hmm. However, let's just say that I grab, um, I've already done the pull, okay? So I already have, I've done the pull part. So I'm gonna take the second command and I'm gonna stick that in here. And when you do that, it says that this indicates that the Docker daemon is not running. Uh, okay. okay. So, but nowhere in that book does it say that you actually need to um, have the daemon okay. running. Yeah. It just says install it. So is that something that they need to include or is it something I'm um, doing wrong? Yes. I, I haven't seen that before. So let me, I'm just, I'm just firing mine up to see if I also have the same thing. Okay. Pavitra, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, can you run Docker run the name of the image? You already downloaded Docker run. What is the name of the image? This yes. one. Yes. Sure. Okay. That's the name of the image, okay? Hmm. It says that it indicates that the Docker daemon is not running. So I think that's a, so, okay. So the, um, I think what's happening is Docker does need a daemon running, and that's so. Um, the daemon is a server that basically says, you know, when you when you do the Docker run, it says, uh, okay, I'll use this as the engine to be able to to launch the Docker image. Um, and on mine, it's just always running. I think I've been through a couple of reboots, and it's just there. So I just tried it on mine, and if I if I put in that same command, I, I get my my prompt. Uh, I think in. it's because you probably have it in your startup that the Docker the desktop just starts running the minute you start up your laptop, perhaps. <clears throat> and yeah. maybe that's why you. But for someone who didn't have it before, and the fact that it wasn't mentioned here, like it took me a while to like because I thought initially it was a path thing, and then I realized it was not path. Uh, because if you actually explicitly start the, the daemon, the, this, this pro problem goes away. So I'm going to go ahead and start up the, I feel like it's something that Jero needs to include in that book, that if you are not like, you know, using, you haven't used Docker before, then you would likely need to have the daemon running for any of these commands to make sense. So um, it's up the desktop right now. Um, okay, so let's just give it a minute. Yeah, it should be like the, the Docker desktop app. Yeah, yeah. So okay. I downloaded that, and then I did a pull on that. Like so, um, I pulled the the image of the class. Uh, I'm sorry, the book club image down, but I didn't have the demon running. So I'm just gonna start that up. 
Okay, so like so now once this completes what it's doing, I think if you try the same command in your power yeah. shell, it should probably work. Exactly. So I just yeah. I just checked my uh, um, on my Windows system. I looked at um, at settings and startup. Yeah. And it, it'll come up with this list of things, and you should make sure that Docker Desktop is just clicked to on, and that all. It's clicked to on. Yeah. Okay, got it. So yeah. I'm going to grab this. So I'm going to first take this because I wanted to map. I want to map it to the directory that I've already created. So I'm going to first change to that location, um, which is uh, this dsat cle data. Data. So this is the this is where I actually unzip the folder, and I'm gonna now say I want to map this working directory to this class uh, image container image. Okay, so when I say that, it's all good. Like I don't get any. Uh, there's no issue there. So clearly the daemon had to work. So now when you do that, look at what happens. You start to see an instance here, um, and you you uh, this this is the running instance, and this now changes to a dollar prompt. So if I now look at my present working directory, I'm here in this, and I can also change into where all the chapters are stored, which is here. And you can actually start to see that. And also, Shamsuddin here, I can just pull up the, the command line interface tool, and I can do the same thing here. So if I do present working directory, I can do, uh, sorry, let me increase this. Here. And then um, I can then say the same thing. See, it, uh, so this basically behaves like your PowerShell instance, right? Uh, Brett, like you can you can just use this like a power, like a command interface, command line interface. Um, hey Brett, are you there? Oh yeah, sorry. No problem. So yeah, you should just be able to yeah. So, um, so on my system with with uh, uh, with Docker Desktop set to startup in the in that um, in the Windows startup control panel, um, it just starts up behind the scenes. So I don't I I don't actually usually see this window, but I can still oh. start the Docker images through the um, through PowerShell or the or the command line. Um, Got so it. This, this just looks like another like a GUI way to do the same thing. Yeah, so this is like, it just shows you, um, I mean, like here you can, I don't know what push to hub, I guess you can push stuff up there, but when you inspect this, you see that it's got a bunch of different shell uh, things going on here. So it's kind of interesting because this is your actual container and um, that's the volume. Uh, I guess there are no volumes more to that, but whatever. So I now have this going. Um, I have both uh, a dedicated PowerShell and this is part of the, the Docker CLI interface. So let's come back here. And if I just say, you know, how say, hey, or whatever, like now it's, it's gonna, like it recognizes all of that. So it, this took me a little bit, bit of time to figure out because I was not like mapping to the right directory, et cetera. So it's like the stupidest thing, but it just took a heck of a long time to figure out. Shamsuddin, are you at this point and we can proceed or do you want to try it out so that you're like, you know, everyone's on the same page and we can start? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm already, yeah, I'm on, yeah, I'm all right. Okay, I got it. So, uh, Brett, I did have a few questions. I like I told Shamsuddin that I didn't create a presentation. I was just going to walk through this and do and directly, you know, stick it into this. Yeah, as I said, um, I think for this club, um, uh, this kind of presentation, just working is fine. Um, rather yeah. than preparing for something, just work through. So. So can we talk about this concept of terminal shell, you guys? So terminal is basically the, the interface to the user, right? Like that's where you type it in. So right. what the, is that? The terminal is the is the program that provides the window to, for everything to work in. And the shell is the actual, um, it's like you can kind of, you can kind of, well, yeah. So that, and it's the, 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 uh, um, the right. The shell is is the actual command interpreter. So it's like, in in if you if you relate it to R, it would be like running running R, and you come up with the R prompt. That would be like the R shell. Um, whereas the the terminal is the environment that that's running in. Got it. So when you interface with PowerShell or the 
CLI, you're actually interfacing with the shell, correct? Because it's the that is the one that's actually invoking the the terminal. Right. So um, so the way to describe what's happening in your window here is that you're um, in Windows, they ne they've never differentiated between shells and terminals, at least until recently. So it's the PowerShell terminal that's also running the PowerShell shell. And then inside of it, you're running your Docker image, which is then running the, the bash shell as the, that it's providing that dollar sign prompt. And the bash, Absolutely. so when you, when you enter a command here, it'll, that, that command will be delivered to the program bash and bash will say, okay, how do I, what do I do with this command that you're typing in? So right now we are running inside the container, correct? Because if I did present working directory here, this is what I'm seeing. So clearly when I'm on this, where I can see my local file structure, this is my local environment. But right now I am in the container itself. So this is the container environment, correct? Yes. Okay. Got it, okay. All right, so now let's come back here. And um, so I do have one other question, just to run straight commands for like, um, you know, um, Unix commands, I should not have to be within the container. So in theory, I can just be, I can stay, stay here and I should be able to just say simple things, which, um, or do I have to be in a, in, a, in a command prompt like this to be able to run bash, bash commands? Um, you have to be in the, well, so, okay. So um, you have to be in the prompt um, in the chat. Uh, Sham just um, was talking about the difference between executing scripts and running commands. And you can kind of think of them as think of them the same thing. It's just, they're just two different ways of delivering a command to the bash interpreter. Um, so it's like, you know, in, in, in R, it would be like, um, you know, saying, um, you know, mean of a, a vector in, in the console as opposed to executing mean of the, of the vector in a, in a script. Got it, okay. Okay, got it. All right, I think that's that part is clear. So um, can we talk about this five types of command line tools? I think um, these, are, these are fine, I tested that those do work within this. Um, so a binary executable, a shell built in an interpreted script, a shell function and an alias. So can we just quickly talk about this? So what are the different, what, what is the difference between these types? The command line tools that come pre-installed uh, with the Docker image mostly comprise the first two types, the binary executable and the shell built in. So what is that? that does that mean these are pre-built tools within your shell that you can, um, you can use, or what does it mean? Uh, binary executable comes pre-built in. So, so binary executable is just like a uh, you know like a program that you would click on in, in Windows, um, except that instead of starting up a GUI, it takes in it takes in input from whatever you're putting on the command line. Um, oh. And the reason it's a binary is because it's just a it's a single lump. You can't look at the code inside it unless you have the source to it. Um, so, like. Um, so I think like Git would be an example of that. So Git is, I, I haven't double checked that it's a binary, um, but um, it's probably an executable that lives somewhere on your system. And when you say Git status, um, it delivers that delivers that parameter status to the, to the Git executable. And, and Git says, okay, somebody asked me to run with the parameter status. So I need to return the status of the, of the current you know, Git archive um, or, or Git repo. Um, so built-ins are, so the, 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 the shell itself is a binary, so bash is a binary, um, but then within it, it has a whole bunch of little, you know, other programs inside of it. So like LS is an example of that. Um, so when you type LS in, in bash, it's not running a separate program called LS. It's actually, um, compiled into bash. So it's like when, when bash sees LS on the command. So like when you type something into bash, like LS, um, yeah. the first thing bash does is it says, okay, is this something that I have built in? And it's, it's kind of like the path. So it says, okay, yes, LS is built in. I can execute that, that part of my code and return the, the result from that. Um, if it doesn't find the command that you typed in its built in stuff, it starts looking through your path to see if it can find a, a binary or some other way to run that command. Got it. 
So in other words, all of these are already built into Bash, not into this container image per se, but it's part of Bash already. I, I think so. And I, I, that's why I don't know how to tell the difference. I'm sure there's a command for that. Actually, uh, uh, if you type which, um, if you type which on your command line, that should tell you what it's going to execute for the, the parameter for that. So if I type uh, which uh, ls, actually, so ls is a, is a binary. So um, when I type which ls, I see, uh, at least on my system, I see uh, user bin ls. Yeah. So I can so go and look at that. Okay. Yeah, so if maybe if we come here, we can see all the functions that came with it. Uh, oh, okay. So these are all of the functions that came with your user bin. So this is probably, these are probably all the commands that you can run, presumably. Nice. Yes. Wow, there's a lot of functions here. GD and... Uh, Wow, okay. Add part APK. Wow, that's cool. So uh, let's just for fun try something. Which OD and see what that gives you. Which, uh, let's just try OD, which was one of the functions there. I guess it's it's waiting for you to like whatever. Um, what is OD? I, I saw it as one of the functions here. Um, I don't know what it does though. So I guess. There should be a help or something, right? Um, Brett, can you just do help OD or something or like the question mark? So the uh, the command to get uh, documentation is man, M-A-N. So you can do man OD. And ah, these, these okay. are typically like even more arcane than, than our documentation. They tend to be very long, but they do follow a format. So they can be easy to kind of skim through. Just skim through, I see. Okay, so this is just one of the commands and you can dump files in octal, octal format or whatever. So, okay, cool. All right. Yeah. Well, I I use TLDR. You know TLDR. Oh um, yeah, that's a good one. So it is more better than demand help. Mm -hmm. uh, it comes with uh, like a semicolon or something. I couldn't find the TLDR. I, I just yeah. I just proved to myself that OD that LS is actually a compiled binary command by running OD on it. And I dumped out a whole bunch of octal strings for LS, which of course means nothing to me, but. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's really nice. I didn't um, see TLDR here. So I don't know if it's something that you have to add on top of this. Shams yeah. Thing. Yeah. So oh. as you can see, the man is somehow bubbles. Um, TLDR is something that you need to install. You can look at the chat. Oh, I share but... in the chat. I share in the chat. You can look at something you need to install. Is um, it's more oh. robust than man. Gotcha. So this is like an addition to that. Okay. Uh, so you just type TLDR. Uh, got it. So this is like, uh, okay. Yeah. So it's much more comprehensive than the other. Mm -hmm. It is kind of ironic that TLDR doesn't have a man page. <laughs> so, like, so man is is the traditional that's it's like the traditional method of getting help in the shell so like every yeah. it used to be that every command on your system would have a man page but mm -hmm. you know now that since there are multiple ways to get documentation um if you if it's something doesn't have a man page um you could try tldr on it so you can say tldr and then what you're trying to get information on or most functions will have help internally so you can do like um so I think you could type like ls uh, or like o od uh, um, space dash dash help. And that if it follows convention, that'll give you the help. Um, yeah, there you go, yeah. And one of, the, one of the problems with shell is is just like in, in our programming, like, you know, one of the reasons why everybody loves the tidyverse is because it has this really uniform user interface. Um, yeah but you don't have to write your functions with the uniform user interface. And the same thing happens on, on shell. So like, you know, somebody doesn't have to put in dash dash help as a, as a command line option for their function. So like, you know, you have to kind of guess at what different commands have and it's, it's pretty uniform, but you'll find things that don't have a help option. Gotcha. Well, that's uh that's really good to know because I um, I somehow I only knew of man I had not heard of the TLDR so that's good that it's much more 
Um, so an interpreted script, I guess, Shamsuddin, this was your question, right, for Brett? So Pythonda R and R scripts is that you can read and change it, and not because of the file extension, but because the first line defines the binary that should execute. Okay, that's good. So I'm guessing that if the 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 if you don't have that binary, if it's a Python script and you don't have that binary installed, then you that's why you do the pip and the other things where you actually install the Python binaries, correct? So that you can you can use interpreted scripts at that point. Right. So what's happening when you call uh, fact.py is, you know, so first the shell is looking for it in its path. It says, oh, I have it in my path. Yeah. And then it starts reading that file in because um, yeah. it knows how to do that. And yeah. it, it's expecting to see this first line with the, the hash yeah. and the exclamation point. And that's called yeah. a shebang line. Um, yeah. And that just tells it how to execute the rest of that file. Got it. Got it. Okay. And that's, so this would be the binary that it needs to actually run this script. Right, so it's essentially saying like, dump the remainder of this file into this Python binary. Got it. Okay, well, cool. So that, that part is pretty. Um, a shell function is a function. So yeah, I've started to get a little bit confused here. It is a function that in our case is executed by Z shell because I guess that's what he's using. He's using Z shell, right? In our case, it would be the bash, bash shell. Um, and how do you indicate to the shell, um, how do you indicate that you're, you're running a, a shell function and not a script? Yeah, this is where my shell knowledge breaks down a little bit. Um, yeah, but I have a question. Um, um, for example, here where we run this fac.py, why do we need to put dot and a slash? Um, why do we need to do that? So um, that's so. Uh, when when the shell is trying to decide how to how to run what you what you've given it for a command, um, you know, so we've gotten to where it looks for it on the path. In this case, it's not going to find fact.py in the path because it's not in the um, in the path. So like, I think if you type like, I'm trying to remember for for this shell, if you type uh, um, dollar capital p a t h. One second, guys. I'm just trying to see if I can uh, let's see if it works. Ah, so here it works, you guys. So I think the dot, at least in R, doesn't it mean the current working directory? Uh, uh, yes. Back? Yeah, it does in the shell as well. So, um, so you see, Shamsuddin here. I'm already in data ch2, right? So what I'm saying is that in the current working directory, I should be able to find it. So I'm saying no. there, look for this file, and I'm passing it a parameter, which is whatever value I'm cal calculating factorial for. Yeah, but the file is already in the current directory, right? You don't need to reference it. Why don't we just run it? Because we are already in the current directory. That's, uh, that's a good point. You're right. the, okay, the, let's the, try that. The reason, that, the reason that it requires the dot slash is that uh, um, it's because of how it's constructed, but it's also to kind of prevent people from accidentally executing things. Um, oh. Cause if you think about it, like, you know, this is a command that could do pretty much anything that your user has permission to do on your system. Yeah. Um, so by forcing you to say, so let's, so let's say I had a file in my current record called, uh, LS. Um, I'm actually, I, th I think it'll try to run the version in the current directory first, but well, so let's say it was allowed to execute things without, uh, um, without the dot slash and I had a file in my current record called ls. It might execute that instead of the ls that I really wanted. Uh, whereas by saying dot slash ls, I'm saying, yeah, I really want to use the one in this current directory. Um, or you would just provide the path where you actually wanted to run it from. Yeah. I think how to test that. Um, that makes sense. Shams, are you clear? Yes. I'm going to try and look at this. Okay, I don't, I don't think, well, I can probably just. I'm all right. Okay, so. Okay, I think that that should be fine. So I have a question here, Brett. Do you know what the tilde here means? Uh, tilde means um, in shell, typically home directory. So it's like a shortcut for typing, you know. Um, okay. 
whatever your home directory is. So like if another shortcut to that is to type CD and just enter it without a without a without a command. So so that will do the same thing as just typing CD yeah. on its own. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, so now let me try one other thing here and see if it does. Um, and then let's just do CD and see what we get. You're right, it does the same thing. So it's either the tilde or if I guess if it's tilde followed by something else, you would you would explicitly mention the tilde. That it you wanted it in the home directory. And the dot is because it's the extension and that's the file type, right? I mean that's a file extension name or whatever. Z H Z Z S H R C. Yeah. Uh, I think here I'm pretty clear. So um, alias. Um, I shall replace each alias it finds with the CD. CD data L. And you have you created an alias L where you are listing the. So. Yeah. yeah. So an alias yeah. is essentially the same thing as a function. You're just saying you're you're defining L to be whatever the contents of the thing after the equals is. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I never actually use this, but yeah. Okay. So uh, Shamsuddin, you're clear about that? I think so far. Yes. So good, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. 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 So then here. In this book, I'll focus on the last three types of command line tools, interpreted scripts, shell functions, and aliases. This is because they can be easily changed. The purpose of a command line tool is to make your life easier. Uh, you can find out the type of a command line tool with type, which itself is a shell built-in. So, uh, for, sorry, go ahead. No, that's, that's exactly what I was trying to think of earlier. That's, you know, when we were saying, I don't know how to tell the difference. Yeah, so it's type, type would do that. Uh, let's try it for ls. So ls is user bin ls. ls is bin ls. So, so that, is that doesn't mean that it exists in both of these paths, um, uh, Brett, both in user bin ls and bin ls. Um, yes. So that's uh, I guess type dash a is telling uh, um, all of the all of Even the implementations files. of it. So is this the order that you would go and look for it? So in other words, since you have it would just pick the one that's under the user directory first, and then it would go to the higher level, which is then. Yes, so it'll it'll go in order. So um, it, I, I'm not sure why there are two LSs, but uh, so that's another thing about the path is it'll it'll do things, it'll try in the order of the of the path. Um, yeah. So like if you do um, echo um, dollar sign and capital P-A-T-H, um, that'll show what the path is. And if you look through there. Echo dollar sign P-A-T-H, oh yeah, yeah. Yep. Dollar sign and then a capital okay. P-A-T-H. And so that's, uh, so dollar sign yeah. is just saying, uh, let, show, show me the, the value of this, of this variable in the shell. Um, so if we look through there, it's separated by colons. Um, yeah, so okay. user bin is before slash bin, which is why ls co is coming from, when you type ls, it's, it's executing user bin ls instead of bin ls because it's it's searching sequentially through that, that path list. Got it, got it. Okay, do you know what sbin is just out of curiosity? Um, it's like a uh, system binaries or secure binaries. Ah, um, okay, got it. And a lot, like all of this stuff is just convention. There's no real, there's nothing really built into it. Um, but one one way to think about path in terms of, you know, R is think about it as, as namespacing. So like if I, yeah. um, you know, if I attach a library, all of those functions are available. And like, for instance, when you attach tidyverse, you see like, um, yeah. you know, yeah. filters replaced by filter. So that's essentially what's Correct. happening here. Yeah. Got it, got it. So whatever is earlier in the chain it gets precedence if it does exist in that location. Okay, nice. All right, well, thank you so much. I definitely was very confused there. Um, okay, so what are the others? Command line tools adhere to the Unix philosophy. They're designed to do only one thing and do really well. <clears throat> Grub can filter lines, WC can come and sort and sort your lines. 
the power of the command line comes from its ability to combine these small yet powerful command line tools. So these are all of your outputs. So this is standard in, standard out, and standard error. They are, so both standard output and standard error are redirected to the terminal. So both the normal output and any error message is printed on the screen. So that is um, standard in goes in here, standard out and standard error both are out of the terminal. Um, if you run rev, which I guess is just a standard command, you'll see that nothing happens as because rev expects input. Uh, and by default, that's any key pressed on the keyboard and press enter. So you do need some input to be given and then it then it talks it to the... Okay, that, that makes sense. Um, and here they get into curl, which um, is really... Um, um, here. You know why I can't paste uh, Brett? Like once I'm in the uh, in the prompt, like it doesn't let you actually copy and paste. Oh yeah, that's that's so that's a something that varies between um, between terminals. Um, oh. So in in PowerShell, I think you can just right click to paste. Um, and oh. whatever your shell, whatever shell you're in, if that doesn't work, you can usually. You're right. you know, you can usually right click on the command line and or the, the window handle and uh, um, it'll give you like the menus to paste things. So I think, yeah, yeah, with like PowerShell, if you click on that, that title bar, you can then scroll down to edit and, and paste. Um, but yeah, I think right click. Yeah, no, yeah it, it did work. And so here's, so here's what they're saying. You can pipe the output of curl to grep. So grep will filter, what is it? So grep can, to filter lines on a pattern. Imagine that we want to see the chapters listed in the table of contents. We curl. So curl is just, I guess, it, it just gets gets all of your data, correct? Or like whatever is in that file. And OK, so he's going to talk about curl in chapter three. So no worries there. And then grep is looking for space. Yes? Shamsuddin, did you have a question? I think he's. I think he's frozen. I think he said he had to go to another meeting, so he might be in the process. Of oh, is that right? Oh, I don't hear that. So maybe we wanna we wanna break here. So I'm sure. Oh yeah, he is. Hello. Shamsuddin, are you are you exiting the meeting? Yes. Um. I had I had to go into another meeting now in six meeting, and uh, yeah. I need to okay. Stand well. On that no problem. So I, I don't think we need to repeat anything in this chapter, right, guys? We can move on to the next one next week. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I'll yeah. be able to present the next week. Yeah, I'm sorry that I, I I definitely got stuck. But thank you, Brett. This really cle cleared up a lot of things for me. So this was the hardest chapter for me because it's I kind of needed like some help here. Appreciate it. it. It's a lot of like the kind of core concepts. And we'll, we'll see all this again. So it'll we'll kind of practice it. Yeah, so really, um, so looking forward to it next week, you guys have a good week and see you also. Okay, yeah. thanks guys. Bye. Okay, thank you. Thank you.